by the authority given to Superintendent Atkinson and me, uh, but of course they are subject to further input from you and any changes that you uh, deem appropriate because you are the final word. We're not the final <coughs> word. So uh, I'll open the floor up for discussion. Mr. Chair, first, where it, uh, what's the item number just so it can find uh, documents? Do we okay. know? I, I think we have hard copies. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I thought you said it was on the board. I'm sorry. Yeah, oh, I, don't, oh. I don't have hard copies. Uh, we, I don't have that. So I don't have the have a letter. Oh, it's not on the e-board? Not yet. Okay. The table that you have, we just posted, and you're about to post the letter. Okay. Okay, Thank and you. I think we, that's really the subject of discussion would be that. Right. Uh, Mr. Detail. Chair, we yeah. have copies for the board. We sent a, an electronic copy to all the board members yesterday, mm -hmm. and we have a hard copy in the room in the State Board of Education room. So you may pick yes. those up. Yes. 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 I, th I think that's the focus of the conversation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Mr. Chair, if, just if I may, uh, could you uh, either you or Dr. Atkinson give us an update as to kind of where we stand? in relation to the response to Senator Berger and meeting uh, the requirements that he said we weren't meeting before. Could you give an update related well, to that? Well, I, I think the bottom line is this document fulfills what he has described as the intent of the legislation. His, his letter was a clarification of that. And it's, it's uh, in line with what the budget office has advised us to. Uh, would you like to comment, Dr. Atkinson? Yes, the General Assembly uh, cut the Department of Public <coughs> Instruction by $2.5 million, and it gave the discretion of where those cuts would uh, be made. Uh, in last board meeting, we shared with you an overall picture of the, the amounts in different areas, including uh, how, uh, how much money would be for, for positions in a certain office in the department. And then what you have with the materials here, you will see a detailed listing of the positions that would equal the two point, approximate $2.5 million. Uh, we, so you have the positions. We also are making adjustments to their operating budget, and that is on this handout also. Uh, these are positions that we need, but we, but to meet the $2.5 million, uh, we have eliminated those positions. Uh, then, if you would look at the other page, the, the uh, Senator Burgers uh, in question was whether all of the money appropriated for the Excellent Public Schools Act uh, would be would that be used for uh, administrative or operational costs? And I would just uh, call your attention to what we said in the letter about the uh, 2015 budget legislation. So it talks about providing additional funds to the Department of Public Instruction to carry out the elements of the Public Schools Act, and it identifies the amount of money available. And then going back to 2012, it said the State Board of Education and the Department of Public Instruction shall provide technical assistance as needed to aid local school administrative units. So if you would look at the budget break, breakdown for the Excellent Public Schools Act, you will see the budget that has been uh, proposed uh, for all of those dollars, and you'll see that it includes the evaluation, it includes the reading assessment, the kits, it includes uh, the contracts that are necessary uh, that we have in place to be able to carry out the read to achieve. We're talking about the software primarily. Uh, we're talking about uh, kindergarten, uh, developmental screening, the camps. Yesterday you approved the allotment formula for first, second, and third grade camps and the alternate reading assessments and then the supplemental tutoring which you have uh, planned and then the monthly progress reports, no dollars, and then a reserve for additional funding to schools. So you see that this equals to the amount of dollars that we received in the base budget as well as the expansion budget for the Excellent Public Schools Act. Um, okay. Mr. Collins. Now this is, <clears throat> this is a different list than we received last month. Yes. Uh, uh, excuse me. Uh, 
Last month, we did not include position by position. We included chunks of different positions. And yes, you are correct. This is more detailed uh, information, and we have made some changes from uh, where there may have been a position that we had in one area that we had to maybe switch to another office. So last month, we gave you five different, I believe it was five different areas of cuts. And then this one gives you the detailed list of where exactly each cut is made by position. Well, and so, so my question is, under the last um, <coughs> the January list of, of, of position cuts that I think totaled 18 positions, as I recall. Correct. Uh, many of those were positions that were moved from one one part of the department to another to satisfy the, the cut. Is that what or you're source of funding? Yeah, it was taken from one source of funding to the other. This budget that you see here, um, the budget, well, not the budget, but the positions that you see here are positions that are being cut. Okay, now these are currently open positions, or will we have a, a rift situation for any employee? These positions do not have anyone in them. They are positions that uh, were allocated to the Department of Public Instruction. So we are fortunate because we need all the people we have that we were able to identify positions to be eliminated that, uh, that we did not have people in those positions. So. Uh, so am I reading this correctly that we have 10 open deputy superintendent positions? No. That is the office of oh, the state superintendent. Under, okay. That comes we, under the deputy superintendent. So, so that's because I was concerned about the, the, the number, uh, the, the salary number in there. And I guess one of my questions is, is, is one of these positions the one that Dr. Weeks is leaving? No, it is not. Uh, let me go over these positions with you. Uh, if you would just have the page, you will see that we are eliminating one position in charter schools. We're eliminating one position in cash collections. We're eliminating 0.7 uh, for allotments, the people who um, send money to the local school districts. We're eliminating a 0.66 position in contract management. In IT, we are uh, eliminating a business technology position, uh, another position in home-based support. Mm -hmm. In academic and digital learning, we, uh, Dr. Weeks's area, we are eliminating three, four exceptional children's positions, uh, and one K. And then when you go to deputy superintendent, you will see an office of literacy, three an office of early learning, two in school and district transformation. Then you'll see at the state board the legislative liaison. Then another position in school and district transformation. Uh, another one in teacher effectiveness, or a small amount, it's a point two FTE. Uh, one in educator effectiveness and a point nine three in digital teaching, and then one in NCVPS. So they are the positions that are being eliminated. They are positions for which we will no longer have, and for which we will not be able to use those positions to serve the children of North Carolina and to carry out the state board's ag agenda or strategic plan as well as the uh, General Assembly's mandates. Mr. Davis. So understanding that these are legislative cuts that we will comply with, I get all that, and that these are vacant positions, I, I can't help but notice that every one of those areas you mentioned, Dr. Atkinson, are ones of high importance yeah. for mm -hmm. this board. They're part of our strategic plan. Right. They're critical needs that our districts need the department to be able to support. So um, while you know, com absolutely we'll comply with the legislative direction, I'm really concerned about our ability to support our districts in these critical areas. Um, charter schools, we're already really overwhelmed supporting the success of charters. Exceptional children are critical needs. Dis um, school and district transformation it's readily apparent how much hmm. work we have to do there well, we're going to make this well, work uh, mr davis this comes on the heels of losing all the race to the top mm -hmm. positions yes, and we fought this cut uh, in in the legislature uh, there was a move to cut 
by 10 percent, twice as much as this. Uh, and I think the fiscal staff has taken a look at it over in the legislature. That's the reason why we were given <coughs> flexibility because they couldn't figure out what to recommend to the leadership of the General Assembly. Uh, and certainly we want as much funding as we can for the exceptional, uh, uh, well, uh, Excellence in Public School Act and uh, Read to Achieve. Uh, and we, we want to move as quickly as we can to raise all children up, particularly the low achievers. And yet, when you cut in these areas, which we've been mandated to cut, not specifically, but we had to look at, at everything, um, you know, these were vacant positions, but we were act actively trying to recruit people into these positions. Now, it's not to say that we can't rearrange things as we go forward somewhat, but this is a basic loss to delivery of services. Then, Mr. Chair, I, I know I'm saying sort of preaching the choir, but um, we should be very clear about the impact of these cuts. Well, I think that when these cuts go over to the General Assembly, uh, you know, I. I think they'll take them seriously. Uh, I, I think they're people of good faith, uh, and we, we just have to work with them as we go forward. Can, can, you, can you respond to one, uh, followed up on Mr. Davis's point? Uh, it would seem to me that the choices that you have in doing this is either to cut open positions that, that are, are not filled or uh, have a reduction in force. And, or, a combination. or a combination of that. And so the choices you've made is to take out um, all uh, open positions, which, which have this kind of impact that he talked about. And, I, and could you, without talking about individual positions that would create a, 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 a private uh, uh, issue, can you respond to the idea of why you made this choice rather than a reduction in force because I think there's some RIF rules and other things that uh, you guys had to consider in doing this to make this choice. And we're trying to right. Um, number one, uh, it is certainly a very difficult task to go position by position, people in positions, and to make the decisions about here's the State Board's strategic plan, here are the mandates that we have from the General Assembly. Uh, the strategic plan certainly shouldn't go away and we need to move forward with that. The mandates from the General Assembly have not gone away. So in uh, looking at, uh, in making the decisions, uh, the staff members were involved in figuring out, okay, where can we do the least amount of harm as we move forward? One thing that's very critical to remember that we have been <coughs> cut 150 plus positions so we've been going through this for many years, and then we've left, we've lost the 164 positions, I believe, for a race to the top. So in planning, when we have vacant positions, uh, let's say that we have an exceptional children's uh, position available, we certainly want to have that position, but why would we cut a person in a position who is doing a great job and not and give up that person who is experienced and leave a vacant position. So that's a part of, that's a part of the decision making. If we have, and I'll again use exceptional children, if we have a position in exceptional children uh, working with um, behavioral um, challenged children and that person is doing a great job, why would we cut that person if we have a vacant position that we could cut? So that's a part of the reason of going one way or the Can other. Can I add to that, too? Um, you know, a lot of these positions are not easy to fill, <laughs> first, to even get really qualified candidates. Uh, I am committed, and I hope everybody in leadership of the department, if we have anybody that's not doing their job, we should be, be working on making sure they're counseled out mm -hmm. or, if necessary, terminated. Uh, but 
when you get into the RIF business, which I've been in when I worked for Governor Martin and was a secretary, it gets very expensive uh, because there's what is known as RIF rights. So you don't want to be indiscriminately going out there and riffing people for a lot of, for a variety of reasons. And there's also the other point that I want to reemphasize that Mr. Kobe said. Uh, these, the positions to get to that amount of money does not represent all of the vacant positions that we have. We still have vacant positions. And that was what Mr. Kobe was talking about, I believe, when you said that we could make some adjustments as we go along the way. And I think it's very uh, timely that uh, Ms. Phillips presented <coughs> yesterday because a part of her work is with the Office of State, uh, well, with the Office of State Personnel as we move forward in reassigning or redoing uh, positions that we may need. Um, how many uh, unfilled positions do we have in the department? Do you know what the total number is? I think that this is like 20 or so on here, but Lou, how many? Lou Ann is coming for. Uh, Ms. Phillips? We currently, and of course it changes every day because we hire new and people are leaving. We, um, as of February 1st, had 88 appropriated state-funded vacant positions. 20 th 23 federally funded vacant positions and 20 receipt funded vacant positions. And that's about normal with our turnover rate. Out of a total of? About 123. No, but a total, total of? Total, total positions just over 1,100, 1,126. And uh, that includes our uh, district, I mean our residential schools? Residential schools, and yes. 350 that, positions, residential that schools. So that. Too? Pardon? Do you count NCAT in that total? No. Okay. Well, actually, yeah. In the 1,100, I think NCAT. NCAT has 48 positions. So that's both state and federally funded positions. And receipts. Yes. And receipts. And receipts base, yes. Mm -hmm. And I would add, uh, and Ms. Phillips, uh, I want to make sure that I'm correct about what I'm about ready to say. We have one of the lowest vacancy rates in state government. Is that continuing to be true? Yes, our vacancy rate, our turnover rate is high, particularly this year. We had lots of the race of the top people leaving. Um, we do, we had a lot of retirements. Um, but the vacancy rate is normal for um, private and public sector. Mr. Chair. Just yeah, to follow up on that, uh, when this list was created, this 20, I would assume that these were the, what you would consider the least critical uh, positions out of those 88. and. Do we have a list somewhere of those other 66 or so, or what are 68 employees that, uh, there, to see what they are so we kind of know what we're dealing with yeah. as a whole compared? Because I'm trying to get to what you're saying, Eric. Yeah. Like these are really critical. Yeah. If we're looking at that list as a whole, then we have something to yeah. judge it against, yeah. right? All of our positions are listed, all of our vacant positions and those we're advertising are, uh, are for the most part listed on the website and there may be some positions not listed because a person just left the position a week ago or two weeks ago and we've not <coughs> had the process. Of the, but the majority of the positions would be listed on our uh, website. Uh, Ms. Phillips, will you uh, send us a link to, to those lists, please? Can I, can I ask one uh, on a uh, follow-up on that? You mentioned flexibility. Uh, in, in following up with Lieutenant Governor's position, in the event that there are other open positions that this board would figure, or, uh, we would prefer to take out rather than the ones you guys have selected, if we make a decision to go forth with this cut only using open positions, then later on we could advocate for one or other positions uh, of importance. Uh, because I think that uh, you guys are probably using your best judgment of how to make the numbers work here, and it's it's hard for us at this meeting to be able to say to you, gee, we think that's the wrong one, but it would seem to me that there might be a, another solution that comes up with some of the more crucial positions in the future. So yeah. uh, it, it, I just want to make sure that what you're saying about flexibility is, is that this is something we can revisit um, 
on an individual, on an individual basis as your needs change. For and, and I use an example. One of the things that gives me the heartburn is the removing uh, the uh, the extra legislative liaison. Mm -hmm. It is it's going to be impossible for. Uh, for one legislative liaison to keep up with everything that's going on in the General Assembly when it starts up. And we're going to have to do something with that or else we're going to end up with no legislative liaison because someone's going to get burned out uh, in incredibly fast. And, and, uh, and so if I had to choose today, I'd be pushing back really hard on getting rid of that position. But if I know that uh, we still have flexibility to do that and others, then, I, then I'm a lot more comfortable. Um, I would like Ms. Uh, Phillips to share with the board the process of reclassifying positions. Uh, it is true that we, we can have that flexibility uh, should the board feel that a certain position is very critical. Um, until, um, until recently, the board has always had just one legislative liaison rather than two. Um, but uh, Ms. Phillips, will you tell them the process of how we go, what we have to do to reclassify a position? Right, and, from one and I can continuously work with the directors, the division directors, um, about how work is changing and when we want, need to repurpose a position. Sometimes you reassign work to an existing position or the position, the needs changing so much you can repurpose. So we can reclassify positions. Um, this, and we work with State Human Resources um, Office and also with OSBM to do that. And there's a process for, for getting approval from both and repurposing, um, reassigning positions. And typically how long does that process take depending on uh, the type of position? Um, four to six weeks is a, is a fast one. Sometimes it takes a little longer, but um, that's something we continuously look at. Yeah. Um, and State Superintendent. Uh, the person constitutionally responsible for being your chief administrative officer. Um, I really appreciate the input that you give uh, as we go about that work. I know that there's a fine line between policy and getting into each position. And uh, I have appreciated the feedback and the support and the, um, the great questions that Mr. Kobe has asked as we try to get to this place. And I just ask your, um, I don't know the word, I just ask for your understanding that it is, when you look at the complexity of our agency, it, very, it really is very difficult to be able to um, make one decision without having to think of the repercussions for all of the other positions and the work that we have to do in the department. Uh, we know that digital learning is very critical to our state. Uh, we know that having home base operational and responsive to our schools across North Carolina, uh, what a big task that is. Uh, every day, the people in financial and business services uh, work to make sure that school districts have the resources that have been appropriated to them and that they are responsive to the needs. We think of all the work that we have as it relates to standards and how that takes so much time and effort to get input, input we need. <clears throat> and we know that with the, with the uh, raising, I mean, with the elimination of the cap for charter schools, we know that there's a great need there. And not only is that a great need to support the people in charter, uh, the application process, but we have people as the organizational chart showed you people all over this agency supporting charter schools. Mm -hmm. We now have the Excellent Public Schools Act and you noticed on the chart that we have identified people in each of our offices that support the Excellent Public Schools Act. When you think of the additional accounting, the additional systems that have to be put in place in order for us at a moment's notice when someone says how many students were retained in third grade mm -hmm. somebody has to set up that system so all we have to do is press a button or three or four buttons when someone asks how many students do we have who speak have English as a second language we have to have structures in place so we can answer those questions when there is a bus problem, when there are, we have 
trouble with transportation or child nutrition. We want to be responsive and consequently it takes, we are a complex organization and we have, um, we have success and we have challenges and we've had some failures, but I can clearly say that 99% of the people in this department work every day to make a difference. And we have other challenges that if we don't have people performing, then we want to make them better. And so we have that. So I'm finished <laughs> with that <laughs> presentation. I don't know how to bring all that together, so I'll just stop. Did you, did you prepare that speech? No. <laughs> if I did, I would have had an ending. <laughs> Okay. Gary Davis set you up. Yeah, you did. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, Dr. Oxendine and then Ms. Willoughby. Thank you so much. Dr. Atkinson, I truly uh, applaud all that you are doing to save the organization and to um, make us mindful of the, the importance of maintaining capacity. So, you know, I applaud, uh, and that's what great leaders do. They take care of their organization and they take care of their people, and you're, you're doing that. Um, I don't know nearly enough about the budget as I need to. I've got five more years, five years, one month left on board. <laughs> <laughs> so already wants to give me a quick lesson <laughs> out there. Um, so I'm going to ask some rather ignorant questions, and this is only for my learning, um, knowledge building. So I'm looking at those EC positions, one at 90,000, 40,000, 90,000 again. Could federal funds not be used to pay those salaries? Um, we have limits. Uh, we get administrative dollars for exceptional uh, children, mm -hmm. and much, uh, many of the people in exceptional children are paid by uh, federal dollars. Uh, let me just point out that it's not a ninety thousand uh, dollar salary. It includes the benefits, so mm -hmm. the benefits would mm -hmm. account okay. for about a third. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. So that's uh, important, but um, <coughs> the people who work, uh, Mr. Phillips, I mean, uh, Mr. Mr. Phillips, <laughs> Mr. Phillips. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Price, <laughs> yes, um, what are, where are we now, I'm afraid I don't have the correct number, as it relates to the number of positions in our department or the percent of our positions in the department paid by federal versus receipts versus uh, state appropriations? If you take into consideration the residential schools, it's a lot less. The percentage uh, that is federal is going to be around 42 percent and the remaining being state. If you take out the residential schools, uh, which we do not do because they are part of the department, <laughs> we would be more higher funded with federal uh, positions than we are with state positions. Is is that the question? Yes. So we've gone over the majority if we take out our residential schools. And then the my other question pertains to the um, salary. The okay, it's the in the area of district school transformation. The salary is about sixty seven, sixty eight thousand. With the benefits, it gets it up to over one hundred. So that seems to be, I certainly am talking without knowing anything about the position or the responsibilities of the person who would hold that position. Uh, I wonder, uh, my question is, how have we gotten along? That seems to be a key position, is, is it the responsibilities that well, would go along with yeah. it? I would think that, uh, I have to say that all these positions are key. Uh, all the positions who have, all the positions still with us are key. So it's a matter again, looking, do we take a district school transformation person already operating, already being effective in working with the school district? Do we cut that position or do we cut a position that is vacant? Another factor that I neglected to mention is that as we went through this process, we looked at positions being vacated for the longest amount of time. So that was a factor. Um, a guiding principle is, was that if it had been vacant for at least 100 days, then it was subject to being on the list. Uh, she asked about that specific position, so Rebecca was saying she did. Okay. If you look at... Uh, stand up. 
I think Dr. Oxendine was asking about right. that specific position. The nature of that position. The district and school transformation positions, and quite frankly, the one in educator effectiveness, it's over 100. When the, when the salaries are that high, it's typically the pool from which we draw. These are folks that coach superintendents, they coach principals, and we typically draw from associate superintendents in local school systems. Uh, we moved the one to educator effectiveness that used to be with DST because all of our professional development positions went when race to the top went. So when we were, this is what the position used to pay in moving this position to educator effectiveness had it been filled it more than likely would have been filled at a much lower position because the pool from where we would draw that would not necessarily be an associate superintendent's pool. So some of this does reflect a little bit of movement after Race to the Top trying to keep up with some of the functions we were trying to do. But yes, our DST positions tend to be higher when you look at coaches because these were principals at the local level, these were associate superintendents. And to get them to come and work at the department, we have to at least pay or match or exceed the salary that they had there by enough to draw them to come here. So that would have been, correct me if I'm wrong, and I probably am, um, so that would have been coming out of race to the top? No, now all of these were state-funded positions that were doing work with district and school transformation. But one of the reasons you see such a high salary in educator effectiveness mm -hmm. is because whoever was in that position was a district coach and we're replacing it with somebody to do we're replacing it with somebody to do professional development. So it probably would have been a different pool of applicants <coughs> and we more than likely would not have replaced the position at the level that it was paid before when it was an associate superintendent coaching a superintendent. So we have made a, a few structural changes because we lost positions at the end. But none of these were raised to the top positions. I do not want you to think that they were. It's we've just shifted some functions around. Okay. I, I do have a comment to build on what uh, um, Mr. Price said. Uh, we, we've tried to continually point out to the legislature, if we ever get to more federal funding for this agency than state funding, the federal government has the option of coming in and dictating certain practices to us and our discretion goes away. That's correct. So it's, it's like a sword hanging over our head and I don't want that and I don't think any of the members of the General Assembly want us to uh, have federal control here of this agency's federal dollars or more control than they already have. We come in. Um, okay. Just a uh, uh, challenging task uh, always, and I'd just say that. Uh, I, I just wanted to point out the irony of our conversation yesterday uh, <clears throat> around uh, an expansion budget <laughs> and uh, that we had a very robust uh, conversation around the importance of, of, uh, of every position or everything that we ask for, not just positions, but all the monies that we ask for, that it either be legally or required by policy, or that it be supporting our, our vision and our mission and what we're trying to achieve in the state. And, and there's just, there is overlap. I mean, there's overlap with this and the conversation that we had yesterday. I think, uh, Mr. Davis, that's what you were referencing. <coughs> and this is just challenging. I, I do understand, because you and I, Mr. Chair, have been there in other places where uh, often you would say, you you look at that. It's not just the positions, but it's the numbers, and and you don't realize the savings immediately on a riff. That those mm -hmm. those savings come a little later because you have to have some other uh, things. The other thing is that sometimes you just look at it and say, you know, here's a here's a hundred twenty thousand position uh, a dollar position, and here are three forties. Now I can cut three forties, or I can cut one one twenty, and. And when you're chasing a number, like 2.5, that's part of that uh, conversation, I'm sure. I was not part of it, and, and I'm delighted it, that you volunteered. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I just wanted to, to point out the irony of yesterday's, I mean, you know, whether it's charter schools, which uh, charter school offices or IT, all of those things, digital, that we're, we uh, we're had the same conversation about expansion budget yesterday. And so. Uh, Ms. Willoughby, and then, uh, yeah, 
I don't want to belabor it, but um, based on what June was saying, the superintendent was saying a while ago, I, I think that, you know, one of the misconceptions here um, maybe deals with the fact that a lot of people haven't walked around this building and seen what goes on. And I had the distinct pleasure of keeping June's seat hot for her for a little <laughs> while. And one of the first things I did was walk around this building and talk to people in every cubicle and every office and every venue and ask them about what they were doing. And just like our fine teachers, um, you don't go in a classroom every day and say, I'm here to teach math. You go in and say, I'm here to teach children and students and scholars, I like that word. And much like the, the graphic we use with help, it's about a whole child. And I think this is about a whole agency. And I'm pretty sure if I go up to, to Derek's office right now and ask him about school buses, he would have a lot of other things to say about health and well-being of children. And if I go to Rebecca's office, which I do sometimes, and ask her what she's doing, there are a lot of things. It's, you know, we, the way this has to be presented is person by person, position by position. But, you know, we talked about this philosophically, I don't know, 10 years ago. The way this agency works most effectively is across sectors. And so when we say, you know, any, any one of these is not sitting in a silo by itself. And I just would encourage you, get, get here early one day and just, you know, make it your business to walk around this building, poke your head into somebody you've never met before, and say, what do you do? You know, what do you do that matters for children? Uh, Mr. Collins. One of the things that, that Ms. Willoughby pointed out some time ago um, <laughs> In a, in a question she asked, and that is, how can we be sure that our staffing aligns with our strategic plan? And um, I think that that was a wise observation she made, and I think it's also something that we should endeavor to do. Um, one, to make sure that that the staff, that when we are asked the question, um, you know, is the department got, does the department have too many employees, or uh, or can you do something better? We can at least say we have aligned everything with that. And then also, to Mr. McDivitt's point about an expansion budget, I think it also helps to be able to say, um, this is what we need and why we need it. Right. So I, I don't know how that's accomplished, but uh, I would encourage, uh, encourage that good idea to be pursued. Uh, Mr. Collins, that Mr. is Collins. certainly really important. And in your packet of material, we do have the the uh, excellent public schools act requirements the state board uh, goals aligned with the general assembly requirements the federal legislation requirements and then we have in that material we have each of your goals we've identified each of the divisions in our department and we've identified what office is the lead and what office is the support and we have identified for each of the goals a check um, about how communication supports each of the five goals, data research and federal policy, uh, how safety, safe and healthy schools, uh, architecture integration, quality assurance, all of those. So I would encourage you to keep this document close at hand because uh, this does, at a high level, identify how we are organized to carry out all of the uh, strategic plan objectives of the state board. And then, you, of course, you have the organizational chart uh, where we've also identified how we support um, your strategic plan. Governor Forrest, uh, just two questions. One is a follow-up uh, on Ms. Oxendine's question, uh, which may be to Mr. Price, uh, about the federally funded positions. And there was kind of a quick back and forth about the money, but how many of these positions could be funded, or do we know, from the 23 that are vacant from the federal government? And uh, what are, if you could just quickly describe what the requirements are from the federal government related to uh, what they allow us to fund, I guess. Uh, the requirements would obviously be something that I would have to turn to our personnel operations to handle, but uh, we look to try and switch funding uh, that is one of the things we've done as we've reduced almost 200 positions over the last several years. Uh, we do not have any available funding to 
switch over. We have requested some salary switches with the OSBM. It's a process you have to go to OSBM to get permission to reclassify some things into indirect cost to free up some money to be able to pay salary adjustments to personnel because we're losing people quite rapidly because we don't have any state funding to pay for salary increases, uh, for job increases. Um, the requirements are the same really for a federal position as they are for a state position. I would imagine that's how uh, Ms. Phillips will answer the question. So we don't have any specific issues related to that. We, If there were funding available, we would be able to switch the funding and then have created a, vac uh, a reduction in the state funds in that matter. We cannot do that. We do not have the federal resources at this time to make that happen. So, uh, so we have 23 vacant positions that are federal but no funding from the federal government for those positions? No, I'm sorry, sir. Or we do have funding in those positions. The person, I, I'm not understanding the question of that. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, maybe, uh, maybe it needs to, maybe it's more of an HR question related to why that money can't be transferred to these positions, if, if that's what we're saying. Yeah, those, the 23 federally funded vacant positions yeah. we're actively recruiting for, and we deem those to be important to fill and, and critical. Okay. It, it would be one option to move that money, but that's not something we've considered. Okay, thank you. I that, think, that answers the question. Yes, and I think, uh, Mr. Price, if you would give a little bit more detail about uh, indirect costs and how that works and how we're one of the two states uh, with a, a similar situation. Uh, we have, as far as the requirements, this is not talking about the positions, but federal law puts a cap on how much money that the Department of Public Instruction can use for administrative purposes. Um, for example, in career technical education, there's a cap on how much can be used for administration. And so consequently, when we meet that cap, we would not be able to go over that cap. The, the federal government recognizes that in any type of grant, there has to be some administration and monitoring, and those dollars are used primarily for administration and monitoring and technical assistance. And so those 23 positions aren't all administrative that are in uh, DPI's budget? I mean, what are they if they're not administrative? Um, what, just <clears throat> okay, let me, uh, when I use the word administration, I'm using that to mean dollars, uh, people who uh, lead, guide, monitor, support local school districts to do that which the federal government requires. Uh, and I'm just looping, I'm not looping, I am lumping all of those into one category when I say administration. It's not the definition that one would find in the private sector as to the definition of administration. Uh, for example, uh, career technical education has uh, a regional coordinator uh, in each of the regions or most of the regions. That regional coordinator is responsible for working with local school districts with professional development, with uh, local plan approval, with uh, coordination of work as far as the data systems and the um, plan or performance report. So all of that, I'm just lumping in one sum. Uh, just so just, if I can just follow up, Mr. Chair, just as kind of a broader conversation related to this. And I understand as well, as well the kind of, you know, all the backs and forths we're, we're hiring for those positions. And that's probably been going on a long time, just as these positions I understand have been too, these 20 some positions. Uh, but at some point you have to prioritize. And mm -hmm. at some point you have to say, well, if we have those funds out there and, and these uh, Mr. Davis's point are critical. You're saying, Mr. Davis, these are critical to us back in the, back home. Uh, then, you know, which ones are more important? The, the federal ones that we're trying to hire for or these? Uh, and at some point there may be a balance. I'm not saying all get filled by that money, this. but if that's a yeah. pool of money that's out there and it's available, then, yeah. you know, we should at least look yeah. at that option. Well, uh, that's what we've done in prioritizing the positions because what we've done is that we've taken the strategic plan of the State Board of Education. And we have said that you, one of your goals that it would be that all the students graduate. We have objectives underneath that. That drives our decision making. 
Then when you look at federal legislation responsibilities, that drives how we use those positions. We do not want to be dinged by the federal government to say that we have not fulfilled our responsibility to do monitoring. So all of those are factors going into the decision making and recommendations about what positions we have. Um, and we, we are audited by the federal government <coughs> to make sure that we're using those dollars. In the past, we have received at least two, three, four times a note in our federal auditing and say, you need to improve your monitoring process. So we walk a very thin line, a rope, to be able to take all of the priorities of the state board, of the General Assembly, of the federal government, and to do the work that is necessary to run the complex organization of education in our state. So we have gone through that process. And as you heard yesterday, Ms. Phillips talked about the performance goals. What happens uh, with us is that regardless of where you are in the organization, your performance plan is, is to, for us to be able to roll up your task and activities to the division goals to the office goals and to the State Board of Education strategic plan. So we, we have that thread of legislative responsibility and the State Board's plan threaded throughout the department. And that's our work to make sure that we continue to have that alignment. Okay. Um, this has been, I think, a very healthy discussion. Uh, but we need to move on unless somebody has got something that they really want to say at this point in time. I uh, just uh, would say as someone who comes the farthest uh, to these meetings <laughs> that sometimes the prioritization becomes the farther you are away from Raleigh, the least important the position is. <laughs> and, uh, and so I commend whatever. I just would say continue to assure that out there continues right. to get that service.